Hey, Holly. Hey, Dave. Welcome to the What Difference Does It Make podcast. So happy to be here today. What is happening? <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good. Stash is uh, looking looking fine for November. November, you do. It, it looks it looks very good. We're gonna have to highlight this on our on our YouTube or on our, on our social media because everyone should get a load of this stash. I don't want to creep anyone out. It is kind of pretty bitching. Uh, <laughs> bitching is a word you use in the '70s, and that's when our band that we're gonna talk about started out. That is a good segue. Well, I try. Um, <laughs> we're going to talk about Aerosmith. It's their, their 50th anniversary. It was 50 years ago in November that they played a small venue, which was actually a school, <laughs> like, you, like most bands do. You start out in a high school. Who play, what big bands play in a high, start out in a high school auditorium? If I remember, Van Halen used to uh, play at their high school in Pasadena and, or, or block parties or whatever they did in, back in the day. But I'm sure Aerosmith did the same thing. That was the oh, thing. They all did. I, I think I'm pretty sure Rush did. I think all the big bands did back then, but not now. You don't hear about any bands playing in high schools, but I think that would have been cool. Could you imagine? I saw Rush when they played at my high school. Yeah, I know. It was a thing. It but was a thing. <laughs> but we're going to learn all about Aerosmith and uh, facts and figures and uh, stats and whatever else you need. Uh, who are we talking to today? Holly? We are talking to Richard Beanstalk. He just wrote a book. Actually, he just made an, uh, wrote an updated edition of the Aerosmith 50th anniversary, the ultimate illustrated history of the bad boys from Boston. This came out 10 years ago. And as we talk about in this podcast, the, the band's uh, soap opera continues. There's always drama. There's always something going on with the band. So we're going to touch on everything old and things that are new and, and uh, everything Aerosmith. So let's welcome Richard Beanstalk to the What Difference Does It Make podcast. All right. Do you want to talk Aerosmith? Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> I, I, will, um, I will just start off by saying that this book originally was written about 10 years ago, and most of it I haven't looked at since then. So, <laughs> But, you know, but I, I think I have a pretty good handle on it. Uh, but obviously we added to it this year for the 50th anniversary. But. What did you add to it? We did uh, we did another chapter at the end, which was basically covering the last 10 years of the band yeah. since the book first came out. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and we put it out because it was this month, 50 years ago, that Aerosmith had uh, their, their first official show under the, yes. the band name in a high school. Mm -hmm. What was the original lineup? I mean, as far as I can remember, it was it was Tyler Perry, Whitford, Joey Kramer, and I guess Ray. Oh no, I'm sorry, it wasn't Whitford. It was Ray right. Tabano on second guitar, and Tom Hamilton on bass. The friend of Steve Tyler, um, right? He was Ray the one. Tabano. Yeah, he was. Was he the one who designed the Aerosmith logo? I believe so. Yeah, yeah, and he's still out there, sort of. You know, my my understanding, I think, is that. You know, before all this COVID stuff, maybe you could find him playing in a bar in a cover band. I'm not 100% sure about that, but I think that he was still kind of out there doing it, you know, as a hobbyist. I guess I love that so many of these bands got their start playing at schools, you know, high schools and, and totally. middle schools back then. It doesn't it doesn't happen like that anymore. No, I mean, that's where <laughs> I got my start. Um, it just it didn't it just didn't, you know, progress to arenas <laughs> and stadiums after that. <laughs> But it started the same way, so. Yeah, so, so what is your Aerosmith story? When did you first hear of the band and what, what year and all that? Um, I, I don't even know what year. I mean, it, it definitely started early. I'm 44 now. You know, I would say, so I was around 10, I guess, when the Run DMC Walk This Way came out, um, but which is kind of when I feel like they came back into the, the public consciousness, but I was pretty into them already i just i had an older brother i have an older brother who was a fan uh you know we had i definitely know my first aerosmith record was that red greatest hits record which i think came out in 1980 and um oh. was actually pretty crappy because it had like <laughs> you know right the edited version of sweet emotion like all the songs were like edited and cut in weird ways um but so I do know by the time they kind of came back and they were on MTV and all of that, I was already an Aerosmith fan and knew all the hits, you know. Um, I would imagine probably the first song I heard was Sweet Emotion at some point on my brother's stereo. But but yeah, so it feels like they've just always been there in my life. 
Was that was it on cassette? The edited one? I'm sure you had it on cassette. It was for, yeah, for, yeah. Cassette. cut for time, I guess, because you know you can only right, cut some. Yeah, yeah. the radio and, version. And, yeah, and like actually, sort of a weird sort of track list too. Like you know stuff like I think like remember walking in the sand and it, which is a good song, but not you know one of the nine mm. top ones, I guess. But but it was cool. It was a cool little compilation. Okay, I'd actually forgotten. I, I happen to like that song. It wasn't my Aerosmith era, but I happen to like that song a lot. And I had forgotten about it until I was listening to an Aerosmith playlist this morning. Well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> so, I like their version of it. I think it's yeah, great. No, no disrespect. It just, you know, it, it, I'm surprised it made the cut. But yeah, they've done, a lot of their hits were, were cover songs. Yeah. You know? Yeah, they had some good covers there. You know, yeah. Big Ten Inch, yeah. their first one, you know. I, there you go, yeah. <laughs> Which maybe maybe that one should have been on it, you know. Uh, <laughs> so did you past. So did you work backwards? What was so I mean, it's kind of interesting that you were like in the 80s, you discover probably from Run the Run DMC Walk This Way version of, uh, mm-hmm. Were you a rap fan or how did it come about for uh, to you to you yeah. know, to find this I band? Mean, I was always just a rock fan. I mean, the early 80s was sort of the time of, like, classic rock radio coming in into the scene also. So I grew up on, like, you know, Zeppelin and the Stones and the Who and the Beatles and all that stuff and Aerosmith. And then, you know, by, by the early 80s, I got into heavier stuff. So by that time, I mean, at a very young age, I was listening to, like, Motley Crue and Rat and all that kind of stuff and Def Leppard, like, the stuff that kind of took over MTV um, right before Aerosmith came back. Yeah. So... By the time they came back in with Run DMC, I mean, I was definitely more of a rock fan than a rap fan, but everyone listened to Run DMC and the Beastie Boys and all that kind of stuff yeah. as well. Yeah, early um, 80s are a, were a bad time for Aerosmith. I would imagine you, I mean, yeah. as a kid, just kind of like, well, these guys are, you know, just kind of crap. I don't, I don't, why are these guys <laughs> popular? Because I mean, I, you know, I yeah, kind of came in. would say crap. Oh, yeah, I would. Well, <laughs> well actually, I, mean, I didn't, because I, I people talked about Dylan and Neil Young right. as as these superstars, and in the eighties, th- that was their lost mm-hmm. period. I didn't. I kind of blew them off, and I would yeah. imagine as a kid, you're like, well, "What's the big deal about Aerosmith?" Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would I would say because I was listening to mostly sixties and seventies classic rock, like I was pretty okay in tune with what they were doing. But I will say, like by the time that that Walk This Way video came out, I did think that they were like super old. Um, and granted they're much younger than I am right now, but it was like, <laughs> there's some old dudes playing guitars, you know, but, um, that was just coming from the perspective of a 10 year old. So, you know, they were actually fairly young dudes playing, <laughs> playing guitars and now. Uh, yeah. Right. <laughs> but, but yeah, so, so I was just all of which is to say, I, I mean, they're just one of those bands that I feel like has been a part of my life for my life. You know, I love them. Did you come up with the idea for a, a book on the band or what was, uh, what was the impetus? I think it may, I don't want to say it was a hundred percent. My idea It was definitely a conversation between me and the, the editor of the book, um, who was great. His name is Dennis Pernew. I had gotten in touch with him cause I had read some of the other, uh, books that Voyager press had put out. I think at the time they had just recently put out a similar type of book to this on Neil Young. They'd done, a Pink Floyd one, I think a Queen one, there was a Zeppelin one. Um, and I just liked the layout of the books. I was working at Guitar World magazine at the time, and I think it had gotten sent to me, like a review copy of one of these books. And I was like, oh, this is a cool book. Um, and somehow I knew someone that knew Dennis, and we got to talking, and the idea came up to, to work on a book together. And I'm not sure which one of us said Aerosmith. Might have been me because a lot of times when I'm pitching anything, they're one of the first bands that I mentioned. <laughs> so, but it just, but we were both, it came together pretty quickly. I do remember that, that everyone was into it and we just moved forward with it. I gotta say, and for our listeners too, this is an, illu- an illustrated history. It's called the ultimate illustrated history of the bad boys from Boston. Yes. So I was expecting from the title, I was expecting it to be, I mean, the pictures are fabulous, but there's, it is chock full of information. Thank you. <laughs> um, no, it's- yeah, like I definitely, I mean, the photos are great. I, you know, I was writing the book separately from knowing what was going to be happening on the, on the photo mm. end. I didn't even see that until the layout came together after the, after the writing part was done. But I definitely went down the rabbit hole as far as information. I mean, my, the, you know, at the time I was living in an apartment 
in New York City, and it that you know the bedroom and everywhere was just stacks of books and printouts <laughs> and like you know just anything that I could find on the band, um, you know, and combined with the decades of knowledge just from following them, but my life was just Aerosmith for a, however many months that that all went on and it was fun to do. It was definitely, you know, it can drive you a little crazy going that deep into any subject, mm -hmm. but it was a blast and it wound up, I mean, the manuscript probably wound up being, you know, 50% longer than it was supposed to be. So we, we, we crammed a lot of information in there and some sidebars and different sort of end pieces and really, you know, I figured if we were going to do it, like, let's just, let's do it. Were the pictures chosen by you? Were they? No, that, that came from the publisher side and Dennis Pernil. Yeah. So they handled, uh, and they, I mean, they did some impressive stuff just in terms of, I'm looking through it right now. Um, yeah. Just in terms of some of the memorabilia and artifacts they found. And like, I mean, there's the photos are great, but then just, you know, set lists and like rare single covers and, and just all this sort of, you know, ticket stubs. Ticket and, stubs, yeah. yeah. Like, so it's just some really cool stuff. A lot of it, I was like, wow, I've never seen that before, you know. So so it was fun for me even to, to get it and look through it. It's fun to see a ticket stub with a $4 price tag on it. Yeah, right? <laughs> oh, God, that's crazy. For like 10 bands that are all in yeah. right. rock and roll hall. Of fame, you know? I used to do that. Yeah. yeah. You know, I I love always the the start of bands because and, um, and just seeing like, things that they that they had to do or places they had to play mm -hmm. bands they opened up for i mean it's uh you know i i think you put in there they opened up for shauna na at one point uh, right yeah <laughs> right, yeah you know a, a gig is a gig so that's i think that's what that's what built them and it was always it was interesting in that i didn't i didn't even realize at the time that um that their debut album really wasn't that well received when it first came out or you know they right. they had to work for it yeah, and you see, and you see the story with a lot of bands, but really the ones that are successful. I mean, it's just you know, sure, there's all like the fun stuff and the partying and the and all that, but like they work so hard and they work all the time and they play anywhere and everywhere and they live hand to mouth and you know they play with Shanana whoever it might be and Shanana's great. I mean, you know, I grew up listening to that too, like, <laughs> but you know, you you really you hope to get across with these types of in-depth, you know, stories, how the work ethic, you know, and like how driven these people are because tons of people join bands and start bands and learn how to play instruments and all that. Um, but only a few of them make it. And like they say, you know, it's whatever, 99% perspiration, 1% inspiration, whatever you want to call it, you know, but like, but these guys work their asses off, you know, and that's how they get where they are. They probably have the longest, there are things that, you know, I didn't even remember and I've been, you know, following them since I was, you know, a kid, mm -hmm. things that I didn't remember. They have a lot, I mean, aside from the drug, you know, the debauchery, all of that, they have a long and storied history and something I, I was read, they seem to have sustained a lot of injuries. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's, I mean, I just. It's funny because I think that was one thing I remember too about writing the book. Like you kind of figure at some point with these bands, because the, the history, especially the early stuff, it does get really in depth and it gets very like knotty and tangled and granular. And you kind of hope once you get through that and then you get through the glory years and kind of the breakup and then they're back together and they're just kind of riding out this kind of elder statesman success. You kind of hope at that point you can kind of also coast on the book. Yeah. But not with these guys, because it's like even writing this last chapter for this new version about what happened the last 10 years, it's like it's it's so tumultuous, especially for guys that are now in their 60s and 70s. Like there's a lot mm -hmm. of physical and mental and emotional anguish going on. Yeah. And it kind of never let up for better or worse. You know, they're still here. <laughs> Makes for a good book. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> but that, maybe that's why they did it, you know, just to, to give me material. <laughs> did you get the band's blessing at all? Uh, did you talk to anyone from, uh, from the band? Yeah. Not for the book, but I have interviewed them many times over the years. Um, and a lot of that is in the book. Um, and for, you know, I write for a lot of different outlets, but my main outlet over the years has been uh, Guitar World magazine. 
and I spent a few decades there as an editor in different capacities. So during that time, I've talked to Joe and Brad, and in particular Joe, mm -hmm. a lot. You know, so a lot of that material is in the book. Yeah, it is interesting though that as great a guitarist as Joe Perry is, back in the day, some of these songs he wasn't. Uh, was he not skilled enough to play the lead on uh, on like these early albums, or what? Uh, what what is the story of Joe Perry and, and his studio oh, work? Okay. The um, well, the the sort of the train kept a rolling, yeah. you know, Steve Hunter, right? Stuff. Um, well, you know, as far and it's always been a bit convoluted. As far as I know, I feel like that is the only song. Maybe there's one other on the record. I don't remember where that ever happened. And I think it was probably just one of those things at the time, like producer's choice. You know, again, it's not something I really I don't remember exactly what's in the book about it. Um, and it's been a while since I've kind of revisited that, that story. Uh, but yes, Joe is not playing the lead on the train kept a rolling their version of it on Get Your Wings. I don't know that it was anything in particular. Maybe Jack Douglas thought Hunter would do a better job. Who knows? I, I imagine it's one of those things like Joe clearly was playing all these other solos at the time. He probably could have done that one. You know, it's not the only time something like that has happened with a band. So maybe it was just kind of a spur of the moment choice that made it easier and quicker to get things done or to get where they were trying to go. I don't even remember if it was something that, you know, had Joe's blessing or the band's blessing. It, it was portrayed as he was agreeable to it. And um, Brad Whitford, too, I think, also okay. didn't, yeah, play on it. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I, I think that's right. Because um, I've, I've heard this happening with other bands, too, and it's not always such a comment on their, their skill, or sometimes it's just wanting a specific thing in that song. And I wouldn't want to put words in anyone's mouth about why that was done. But yeah, but I think otherwise, it's always been them. And it's always been one of those things, too, where... I mean, Joe is clearly the guy out front, but everyone knows that Brad is a great guitarist as well. And, and some of his leads, like mm. stuff like Last Child, is the stuff that people really celebrate and love, you know? So it's, so these guys, these guys certainly have the skills. So I don't, I don't really know why that happened at the <laughs> time. All right, we're in the middle of our fascinating talk with Richard Beanstalk, he of the Aerosmith 50th anniversary book. We'll be right back. We're back with our interview with Richard Beanstalk, author of Aerosmith 50th Anniversary, The Ultimate Illustrated History of the Bad Boys from Boston. What is your impression of Joe Perry? You've talked to him a number of times. What, uh, yeah. What's he like? Obviously, he's driven. What is his approach mm -hmm. to guitar? Joe has always been great. I mean, I've had the opportunity to, to actually go and spend time at his house a few times for some of these interviews near in the Boston area. And also at his house is where they have, he has the studio, the Boneyard, where they've done some of their recordings. So getting to go down there and see all the guitars and just all the equipment and everything and, and even getting to, to sort of play with him a little bit. Um, you know, he's just a really, he's a very natural player and he's very, he'd probably be the first to tell you, like, he's not the most technical type of player, um, which is fine. That that doesn't really mean anything in the long run, but he has such a, I mean, maybe even Brad is the more technical of the two. Um, they would probably say as much, but Joe has such a particular style and sound and, and touch where you just know it's him. I mean, mm -hmm. I can hear a lead guitar part and know that it's Joe just because I've been listening to Joe for 40 years, you know? So like you, you know, his sound and not, and you don't know that with every guitarist, like that's a special thing when somebody has that. So to get back, I guess, to the original question a little bit more, you know, as far as Joe's approach and, and again, like I've only probably the first time I interviewed him was, you know, like early mid two thousands. But at that point already, I mean, he's, he's like an, an elder statesman, like I, you know, his, whatever he approached, whatever his approach to the guitar is, it's probably much more relaxed at that point than it was when he was younger. And it's just very natural. He picks it up. He plays like him, but he's very in touch with the instrument. Like he picks it up and it's just sort of, it just seems a lot of these guys, 
it, it just seems like a part of them. It's an you extension get, of him for yeah, sure. It's, you get it. It's you get that feeling from him when he's playing. And personality wise, I mean, he was always super laid back and and very open to you know any sort of question and very welcoming. You know, I like him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, so then let's go to the early 80s when Aerosmith <laughs> yeah. did not have Joe Perry and there was the mm-hmm. Joe Perry Project. Have you revisited those? I mean, when you were doing the book, I'm sure you, yeah. you kind of went down the hole and listened to those albums. What What's your impression now of those records? Is it, did Aerosmith need Tyler and Perry? They need, you know, yeah. the, <laughs> they need to have each other. You know, it's like Jagger and Richards and, you know, like every classic duo. Um, sure. but, but But they're not that... Those records aren't that bad, actually. I mean, but uh, what yeah. do you what do you think of those and wait and the Joe <laughs> Perry project? Yeah, well, I mean, you can I mean, you can look at the Joe Perry project, and then you can also look at the Aerosmith record without Joe and Brad on it, um, which isn't terrible either. Um, you know, probably not their worst record, certainly not their best either. But um, but there are a few good songs on on Rock in a Hard Place. As far as the Joe Perry project. The first Joe Perry project record, Let the Music Do the Talking, I think, honestly, is like almost as good as any Aerosmith record, in my opinion. Like, I love that record. Yeah. Um, I love Joe's kind of, you know, Joe's, Joe's singing style is probably an acquired taste, um, <laughs> but I love it. Like, I love the sort of laid back, like, speak, sing, you know, mm-hmm. speak singy type of thing he does. Very different, obviously, from what yeah. Tyler does. And I love Tyler, too. But... I just love what he does on that record. I think the songs are great. I think his his guitar tone's great. You know, I think after that first record, they get a little a little spottier. Partly, you know, because Joe clearly wasn't in a good place in his right. in his life, and there was a lot of turnover in terms of the the band members as well. He does more. He does less singing. He doesn't sing everything on that first record, but he probably half of it i don't really remember exactly but i think he does less as time goes on and i think also those joe perry project records start to fall victim more to that 80s type of sound like the you know the big reverby drums and just uh, that that sort of outdated sound whereas the first record sounds like a 70s record even though it's like 1980 or whatever but but yeah like that first record i think is just awesome and i think probably his version of let the music do the talking is better than Aerosmith's version. Let the music <laughs> do the talking, you know. So, so I, I dig them. Talking about the this big eighty sound, Aerosmith comes back with these, you know, their their permanent vacation and mm-hmm. and and mm-hmm. then pump, you know, just like these this one two punch of like, sure, here we are. The the singles are great. What do you do? You like that sound of Aerosmith? I mean, I guess you were probably you were like right in the thick of it that you know as a teen. Do you, do you like listening back now on, on uh, those, those albums? Do you like those albums still? I do. I'm not a huge fan of Permanent Vacation. And I don't, I wasn't even at the time, actually, which was interesting because I was, I was like super deep into all that type of music at mm-hmm. the time. Um, you know, the hair bands and all, all the bands that sort of Aerosmith spawned, you right. know, whether directly or indirectly. But I remember being sort of under, I remember wanting to like that record more than I did. And even at the time, only being like, you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, but like really just wanting to dig it more than I did. Like, I, I, you know, I didn't lo- love like Ragdoll or Angel or mm-hmm. any of that stuff that much. Pump, on the other hand, is just awesome. Like, it's just, I don't know what the difference was in between those two years. Probably Permanent Vacation, they're probably still kind of getting their feet back under them a little bit from, you know, the Mm -hmm. the downtime and like getting clean and all of that. And maybe even just learning to play together again. And it's also a little bit more of like an 80 sounding record. Yeah. Um, Whereas pump comes out, I guess, you know, 1989, I think. And it's just, I mean, it sounds great. The energy is like off the charts. The songs are great. And like, you know, Tyler's funny again, the, the planes on fire and just, you know, I think that Pump is as good as anything they did in the 70s. And, you know, I probably would put on something from the 70s first because I, you know, I just kind of preferred overall. But you can't deny what they did on Pump, especially the first side of that that record, which is when there were <laughs> sides to records. But, like, I, I've always felt, I mean, you listen to the way it starts, you know, you go from, like, I think it starts with Young Lust and then it's 
F I N E and then right into love in an elevator. And like those three songs just like explode Mm. and it's just doesn't let up. And it's just like, it's just so energetic and so vibrant. And I really just think that that was another high point for them. And they looked great at the time, you know, they looked healthy and, and it was, to me, that was sort of, I mean, permanent vacation was the comeback, but punk kind of seemed like the, the turning point you know, where they really were like a force again. To look at it objectively, you know, if you were a fan of the early stuff and then to, to hear what they were putting out in the 80s, if you just, if you take it them as separate entities almost, you can appreciate it more, I think. I think so, yeah. And you even, you know, and I'm speaking to someone, I never saw them obviously in the 70s, but I did see them around the time of Pump. And, you know, even if you look at, videos on youtube or whatever from the 70s and then look at like i think around the time of pump they did there was a show a club show they did at the marquee in london and like jimmy page comes up and plays with them a little bit it might have even been to like promote pump when it first comes out my uneducated sort of you know opinion again because i didn't <laughs> see them back in their heyday was is that they they seemed like they were probably a better live band in 1989, 1990, even than they ever were in the 70s. Cause it's just like, they're just incredible to even see on stage. Like they're like, you know, it's just, I mean, just the energy again and like Tyler and Perry and all of them, it's just, it's unreal. Like what they just, the level they were playing on, I feel like at the time of pump. Was that the time, um, was Guns N' Roses opening up for them then? Is that, <laughs> cause I feel like that kind of pushed them. Like, you know, we gotta, we gotta raise our game or, um, I think, you know, I think Guns N' Roses may have been, was that? I don't know. They may have been permanent vacation actually. Yeah. You, yeah. I'm yeah, trying to think of the time. Was, yeah. yeah. Because that was the first, yeah. That's yeah. True. But I saw that cause I saw them on the pump tour and I think like Skid Row was opening for them, you know, and Skid Row <laughs> were great at that time too. Yeah. Um, but, but yeah, but you know, all these new bands were coming up that really sort of idolized Aerosmith and, you know, I mean, yeah, Guns N' Roses weren't on the pump tour, but they had been on the tour before. So maybe even going into the studio the next time, which would have been when they made Pump, it's like they're very aware of these bands that are sort of, you know, taking what they had done and bringing it to the next level. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them doing it in a very good way, you know, like like Guns N' Roses, um, who were always very open about their love for Aerosmith. So, yeah, that probably gave him, you know, a little kick in the ass as well. <laughs> Did you see, you saw uh, the metal year, Decline of Western Civ, the metal years. Sure, yeah. Yeah, so I, I <laughs> what were your impressions? Yeah, pre- and like, yeah. Aerosmith don't look that good in that. You right. Know? And like they're, <laughs> I guess, you know, they're probably like, I guess they're cleaned up at that point. I don't know, it's kind of like right around, mm-hmm. but like they're not, you know, they still seem a little bit shaky, even when they're talking, you know, so... But yeah, so, yeah, I always remember because everyone had the scar, you know, like all these bands had scarves around the their microphone mm-hmm. and they're asking them, where, where'd you think of that idea? Oh, I don't know. I don't know what that right. is. <laughs> just made it up. Yeah, I just I made it. Yeah, it just seemed like a cool thing. But yeah, everyone, right. everyone was paying homage to, to, to Tyler. It's all Tyler. Yeah. yeah. The, this whole, this backward masking on Sweet Emotion. Is that, do you know that to be true? I never, I never tried it myself where he was. <laughs> Oh, I don't even know. Like, what, what to, do you know what they're, what they supposedly say? Or? It, it was something about saying goodbye to their, their manager that they, Frank, the, the manager early oh, on. Yeah, that they yeah. were, I do so, not okay. So you don't know this. I'm looking to an, an authority on the topic to know if it's true. Cause I never, I never tried well, it. <laughs> now that you mention it, I think <laughs> it, the, the story sounds familiar and it might actually even be in the book. Um, but again, <laughs> it's not something that I've come across <laughs> in the last decade. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, you can do, you can certainly do that stuff. And like, I was, you know, I remember being a kid again, like with my brother and playing like Led Zeppelin four backwards and trying to hear, you know, I, mm-hmm. I think in stairway to heaven, they say like, it's going to snow or something. I don't know. I don't even remember what it was, but like you would do that stuff and, and you would believe that you could hear it. Yeah. I don't remember if we actually did hear it, but, but yeah, you can do that. You can, you can certainly do it. So yeah. I might have to go whip out my vinyl after this and try yeah. it out. <laughs> That's right. Before we had the internet, we had word of mouth. You had to, you had yeah. to hear it on yeah. the street. Yeah. I mean, you could actually, you could probably even just go on YouTube and type I'm sh- in. I'm like, sure it know, is. Yeah, I'm sure it is. For, for only 20,000 opinions. And- <laughs> right. <yeah. laughs> 
you're an author. What do you think of uh, both Steven Tyler and Joe Perry wrote uh, memoirs? What, mm-hmm. what do you think of those? Do you like those books? I thought that they were really good. Um, the The Tyler one was more, uh, it was very, for better or worse, it was, it sounded like Tyler, you know, like it sounded, it was well, like, you very, would hope like, so. <laughs> yeah. It was almost like just somebody recorded him and then like just <laughs> transcribed, transcribed. It yeah. Paper. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, I think I remember like there might've be even been some things where you're reading that and you're like, well, that's not correct. You know? And like, and again, like someone's memory is their memory, but you know, you're like, I don't think that's the way that happened. <laughs> um, or even like, and not stuff that it's like my opinion versus his. It's like when something like came out or was released, you know, at the end of the day, that doesn't really matter that much. I mean, you definitely get the vibe from him and you get where he's coming from. Um, you know, Joe's was more straight ahead. It's sort of like, matches kind of the way their personalities are like Joe's is more sort of just dry and honest and laying the facts out, or at least what he sees as the facts. And then Tyler does it in his Tyler way. The book that was really great was the walk this way book, which was the band autobiography that came out I guess in the nineties and was sort of like an oral history where they're all speaking. Um, And that was really, that was, I thought an excellent book. It was obviously something that I read while researching my book, um, probably write even more than once. Um, but I thought, I thought that as far as band biography, autobiographies go, that was a really well done book. It's funny. I think Dave and I, we, we've talked about this recently about how, when you're reading a, a, an autobiography, when an artist who's been through so much Mm -hmm. and they can recall such, such a incidents with such clarity, you wonder, is that really how it happened? But you have no, nothing else to go by. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, the joke people always use is like Nikki Six's Heroin Diaries <laughs> book and like how when he's, you know, Odin in a closet, like he also managed to um, do his, his journal entry for that day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's, 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 it's a book and, and you read it and you sort of suspend disbelief and, and you know, go from there. <laughs> Creative license. It's their story. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, well, we haven't even touched on the other three members of the band. You, you got Joey mm-hmm. Kramer, the, he's amazing drummer, uh, Brad, Brad Whitford and Tom Hamilton. Um, yeah. what, can you just kind of touch on what they led to the band and, and how they, you know, without those three guys, there, there is no Aerosmith, really, you know? Yeah. I mean, they're all certainly important to the band. And, you know, some of the guys have been in and out of it, like Joey Kramer, obviously, even mm-hmm. very recently. Yeah. But- you know, there's also something to be said for the fact that this is a band that's been around 50 years and today has the same lineup that they had on the first record. And I don't really know any other band that has done that. Um, so clearly they're all important, you know, for what they bring musically and also just to personality wise to the mix. Um, Brad is like we were saying earlier, he's a great guitarist. A lot of people think of him as more of the technician type of guy uh, than Joe. And then, you know, Tom, as as Steven Tyler says at every show, introduces him as the guy who came up with the Sweet Emotion bass line. And, you know, you do that and sort of what else do you even need to do? Right. <laughs> That's enough right there. But he's obviously great otherwise. And then Joey, and it's probably in my book and certainly in these other Aerosmith books, like there's there's always, it's always been well documented sort of the grief that he has gotten from Steven Tyler over the years. Uh, Tyler also being a you know, a sort of alpha personality and, and a drummer originally. So yeah. he, he sort of picked on Joey Kramer a lot, but Joey Kramer's a great drummer, which is probably why he always stayed there too. And he's one of these guys, you know, a big key to the Aerosmith sound is that funkiness mm-hmm. that they have, especially in the seventies. And a lot of that's Joey Kramer. And I think what's great about what he does is when a lot of these rock bands try to get funky, they sort of, get very like, I don't know the way to put it, but they get very um, sort of overly funky and the sort of idea of what you think a funk rhythm is. And like they get, they sort of overly complicate it. Whereas Joey Kramer and stuff like, you know, Walk This Way even or Last Child, like he's able to, to bring that element to it really by playing just very, very straightforwardly, but very, very heavily in the pocket. And that just, that really brings it. It's not about doing these slippery little fills or kind of showing off, but like, he's just, 
he's he is solid but really loose at the same time and I, and that's a big part of the Aerosmith sound yeah, you're right sometimes they, it sounds a bit contrived when they try mm-hmm. to get funky when right. bands try to get funky yeah all right so, yeah. Should, we, should we touch on the i want to touch on the play, time when they weren't funky at all there's the <laughs> i don't want to miss a thing song uh-huh. the, the big i mean that's you know the power ballad um I guess this is a song for, I guess they, they did it for, for live. What was, what was the band Mm -hmm. entirely into that? I mean, it was their only number one. So I'm sure afterwards they all loved it, but uh, you know, what what was the feeling at the time? I don't think at the time they loved it, except for, um, I imagine Steven Tyler loved it. And I imagine that's why it's, why it happened. You know, again, I can't speak for, for them and to say, Oh, you know, Joe Perry didn't like it and that, but maybe he didn't. But what I do know is, because I remember, I think the first time that I did interview the guys, it was when they were doing, they had a greatest hits record that came out in the early 2000s called, I think it was called Oh Yeah, is when it came out. And I went to Joe's house that time and I interviewed, I think it was Joe, Brad and Tom were there. Mm -hmm. And we were just talking about, so because they were, because it was the greatest hits record that was coming out, we were talking about all the hits and all that. And we did wind up talking about I Don't Want to Miss a Thing, which was just a few years old at that point. And I think it was Joe who made the comment, you know, that it was that he didn't love it. And that, you know, he, he said in 10 years time, you know, we'll still be playing Sweet Emotion at every show, but we won't be playing I Don't Want to Miss a Thing. You know, it's almost 20 years later and they play I Don't Want to Miss a Thing at every show. Yeah. Like that is, you know, that has never left the set list. Um, so all of which is to say it's probably grown on them over the years. And also it's just, it's undeniable whether they like it or not, people want to hear it and doesn't mean they have to play because they have plenty of other hits that they could play and people would not go home, not satisfied, but it's an acknowledgement that like people want to hear the song and it means something to people. And, you know, maybe that's enough to, to keep it in there and to keep playing it. What's the song that means the most to you when you think Aerosmith What's the number one cut that you put at the top of your playlist? <laughs> um, my number one, you know, I think I've always loved the song Draw the Line. I think it's a great song. Um, you know, loved it since I was a little kid. I feel like more recently it got more sort of spotlighted at their shows. Like a lot of times it's been the opener recently um, over the past however many years. And I just think like, I don't know, it's got just a great groove to it. It's got great lyrics, a lot of attitude. I I love, you know, where it kind of breaks down in the middle and then it comes back up and, and Tyler just sings that last verse and that super high screech, Mm. which he still does perfectly to this day, which is amazing because any other singer I think would just kind of not even attempt it anymore, but he does it and he hits it every time. And I just, I just love the vibe of that song. Um, I love the vibe of a song like uh, combination on rocks which is kind of this like weird like tyler and perry both singing together or like singing over each other you can't even really tell sometimes who's doing the lead on that but it's just such a you know that that's another song that's got such a vibe and such really just evocative lyrics you know i think the thing with aerosmith is like especially nowadays they're such an institution they're all and i mean they're like sort they're family friendly at this point i mean to you know let's be honest but (laughs) you hear some of that type of stuff and you kind of remember like they're, they were this sort of dirty, like ratty drug addled, you know, blue jean, like guys in the seventies. And like, you know, you kind of hear that seedy underside of where they're coming from and that sort of outsider thing that they don't have anymore on, on a song like that. And, and that's, I think what I really love about it. Well, you touched on family friendly and I guess um, that kind of, led to uh, Tyler being on American Idol and being a, a judge. And mm-hmm. that kind of almost broke up the band once again. Um, yeah. what, and what officially, what, I mean, I, you've talked to Joe Perry. Have you, did you talk to him about that or that, that situation? I did. I talked to him about it. Um, one of the interviews I did with him, I think it was right when that was happening. I think it was either right before Tyler went on American Idol or right after, but it, it was... You know, he, he talked to, and he talked in other interviews at the time about it, but he definitely talked to me about the fact that, like, I don't even think that they really knew it was happening <laughs> until it happened. You know, they might have found out about it in the press or I don't know, yeah. but but there were clearly things going on behind the scenes. But he was not, 
happy about it at the time. And he was, it was, it was during that time where I think he might've even said, you know, Aerosmith will continue with or without Tyler. Like they might've been talking internally about whether he could be replaced. And I don't blame them for thinking like that. I mean, they probably felt pretty betrayed, (laughs) but you know, Tyler, I'm sure would have a million reasons why he could justify doing that, you know, that you can't really get into sort of the inner workings of these guys and the ups and downs over all these decades. But I do remember at that time he was, he was not happy. Um, and clearly you're not going to replace Steven Tyler and Aerosmith, but nor do you need to because Joe went out and he did a solo record and he did solo tours and like, you can just, he has his own material to stand on anyway. Mm-hmm. But yeah, you know, and I think the, the interesting thing, that I would say about Steven Tyler too, is just, you know, he did all of that and it's just always, and I don't know if it really, you know, helped his reputation or hurt it. I don't know that it really matters anyway, but it still it was just amazing when he came back to Aerosmith. Like, I feel like every time I've seen Aerosmith over the past 10 years or whatever, I'm always thinking like, eh, it won't be that great. Like they're getting older, you know, Steven Tyler has all these health issues. He's been on TV, blah, blah, blah. And I'm always just amazed at how good the band is and really especially how good he is. Like, I don't know that there's any other guy from that classic rock era. I mean, you can like his voice or hate his voice, but his voice still sounds exactly like his voice did 40, 45 years ago. Like, and he hits every single note and he, you know, scats and ad libs and doesn't, you know, gasp for breath and he runs around and he dances and he you know, humps the stage and does whatever else he's going to do, but he does it at 72 and he sounds phenomenal. And like, I don't think there's any other singer from the seventies or that, that still, that, that, that hasn't changed something that has told the band to tune down a step or, you know, doesn't sing every word, or doesn't hit the high notes, but he does, he does it all. And he does, and he's incredible. He's like this weird force of nature. And just a freak of nature thing. Yeah. For like, sure. It's, you know, despite what he's done to himself over the right. years. Yeah. So what would you say? Best American band, American <laughs> rock band. What do you think? Where, where would you, what, if you're going to rank your, your American rock bands, where would you, uh, <laughs> they're pretty <laughs> high up there. Like, I don't know, you know, I love, I don't know. I mean, I love the bands everyone loves. I, I love ACDC. I love Led Zeppelin and all, but none but of these bands are American. Right. So, yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so they might, yeah. so they might get it. Um, you know, they're certainly, if they're not the top, they're, they're certainly one of the top, you know, you can't, you can't deny that with them. And they're still, they're still going. Like if they, if we weren't all stuck at home right now, they'd be out on the road and like, I'd be going to see them and, and it'd be a great show. I mean, I saw them at the, I saw them in Vegas. What, so, yeah. What was that like the residency? Cause I yeah. never got a chance to see that. Yeah, that was great. I went to opening night um, and I did a story with, with Joe and Brad for that as well. And it was great. You know, I think, uh, again, it was a little bit weird because they they opened the show. It was this great sort of video montage and it went on for like a half hour, their whole history. And like, you know, you're seeing. But I think that maybe they read their audience a little bit wrong because I'm sitting there and it's like the people around me. I mean, there are people in Vegas, you know, and like you go to Vegas and you're like, oh, Aerosmith's playing. Like, I'll go see that. But these are people that want to hear dude looks like a lady and, you know, or walk this way in sweet emotion or whatever. I don't know that they care that much about seeing Sunapee, New Hampshire and the barn where they rehearsed and like, you know, and Ray Tabano and all this early stuff. Like they don't know about any of that stuff and they're not they're not that kind of fan. But the show was great. You know, they, it was a good mix of, of songs and, you know, it was a cool setup and the sound in that room was great because it was made specifically for that room. And again, it was another one of those things where I went in, it had been a few years since I'd seen them. And I was like, eh, I don't know. We'll see how it goes. And like, I was like, they're son awesome. Of, son of a bitch. Look at that. <laughs> they did it again. Yeah. They uh, well, yeah, this has been great. Um, <laughs> I, I really appreciate that. Uh, I, I could talk Aerosmith for a while. This is fun. Yeah. I could I could do a whole episode on Joe Perry. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's, let's we'll, do we'll do it. another we'll, one. We'll, you know, one episode on each guy. Yeah, I, yeah, exactly. There you go. We got a podcast, a new podcast. This has cool. been great. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate uh, you you taking the time and talking Aerosmith yeah. with us. Same. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate you having me on. It was, you know, again, just like you guys, I'm always game to talk Aerosmith or, or anything else. Oh. Oh, we're marking you down as friend of the show. So every yes. time uh, we need an, an authority figure, we'll reach out yeah. to you. 
If you need any comment, just call me up. And yeah. I'll just comment, I'll just comment <laughs> no matter what, what it is. What do you yeah. think Richard thinks of all this? Let, let's give him a call. It's shit. It's, so, uh, there it is. Yeah. <laughs> shit sandwich. Boom. Yeah. yeah. Whatever you need. But yeah, I appreciate it. So that was cool. That was, okay, bi- that was... <laughs> that was bitching. That was rad. That was totally awesome. <laughs> oh, that was 80s, which is fitting. That was so great. I really learned a lot of things about the band I did not know. That was uh, super cool. Yes, and you'll learn even more by digging further into this book because, uh, you know, when you get a box set of a, of a band, you usually get a small booklet and some information and uh, a little ephemeral type stuff. This book is chock full of it. Yeah, the photos were great. The photos and all the, I mean, the ticket stubs. That was really fun to see. That's right. I want to pay four bucks and see Aerosmith. <laughs> yes. Let's go back in time and do that. Oh, those were the days. I bet he waited in line at Ticketmaster to get that ticket. Yeah. Or your local, let's see, in Boston, it was uh, Newberry Comics. I'm sure you had to wait in line at Newberry Comics to see your bad boys of Boston. Whoa, good call. Yeah. You have that knowledge stored away. That's right. Well, I, I know that. <laughs> And the Toxic Twins. Who are the Toxic Twins, Holly? The Toxic Twins, of course, are Joe Perry and Steven Tyler. So it was great to, to talk about the band. At the end of our podcast, we locked him in. He said he's a friend of the show. So as friend of the show, we can call him at any time and he will be on our podcast. <laughs> no, it was great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Richard Beanstock for talking to oh. us about his Aerosmith book. Big thank you to Steve Roth. He of the Quarto Group who helped to hook us up with our new friend, Richard Beanstalk. Thank you to Holly. Always part of the podcast and uh, my my favorite partner. And thank you, Dave. Thank you for being a friend. (laughs) Ah, very nice. Well, you know, it is Thanksgiving's coming up. So, you know, I'm thankful for you, Holly. And I am thankful for you, Dave. Well, thank Thank you. you You are you are the best and perfect partner. I'm, I'm going to save that leave one. Leave that in. <laughs> yeah, I'm leaving that in. <laughs> On that same thank you note, thank you to our audience for listening to the What Difference Does It Make podcast. And please follow us on, on social media. You can find us everywhere at What Difference Does It Make podcast or WDDIM podcast. WDDIM podcast.com if you want to sign up for our monthly newsletter. We are a proud member of the Pantheon podcast family. So until next week, this is Dave. This is Holly. Check you later. Over and out.